there's a couple of mortars came through just over to my right. The square miles of areas which were just totally flattened. American helicopters had, had come in and where the VC had been attacking through this area and they just flattened the area. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. If anyone to us, by the time anyone got to us, oh, I think it was if chaos. the weather was so bad, there would be nobody left. Boots full of blood. And the next thing I hear was alarms screaming. The chances of survival were very, very slick. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so they'd send the That's kids in first. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain burst. I'm proud of the pain. crew. Of what I've achieved and what I'm doing. To volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. For today on Life on the Line, we have two different interviews for you, both with Vietnam veterans. First, I spoke with Ross Tullow. Welcome to Life on the Line. I'm Alex Lloyd, and I'm speaking today with Ross Tullow. Thanks for joining me on the podcast, Ross. No problem. So, Ross, when did you join the army and under what circumstances? Not sure join the right word. I was, I was shanghaied into the army in May 65. How did you feel about being conscripted? I was a 20-year-old kid. It was a big adventure. It, uh, I quite looked forward to it. What was your training experience like? Uh, in the army? Oh, well, uh, we did. I did three months basic training at Pakapanyal in Victoria, then I posted to the engineers and did three months engineer training at Kasula out near Liverpool, and then joined one field squadron and did three months training with them for unit training, and then jungle training up at uh, Kanunga in Queensland, and uh, off to Vietnam. Can you share with me any experiences or memories from Pakapanyal? We were the first call up, and Everything was new in those days. The whole camp was new. Our platoon sergeant stood up and addressed us the first time when we were, when we arrived. And he said, now, you buggers probably don't want to be here. Well, well we don't bloody well want you here either. So, <laughs> that was my introduction to uh, Whakapanyal. Oh, everything turned out okay. How was Canungra? It was, it was okay. It was quite, quite taxing. Uh, I don't know if if you know what a gimpy bush is, but it's a. Can you describe it for our listeners? I can. It's it's a bush that stings you and it hurts like hell. And they were everywhere. Hmm. They were indeed. As you got more progressed into your training, did you feel that the rank training you were starting to soften up to your cohort as national servicemen, or were you always sort of looked down upon? Oh no, we were never looked down on. No, we were treated the same as regular soldiers. But what about that first sergeant that said he didn't want you? Oh, well. It, oh, that was just a character. Yeah. He's got to put on the big show no, to nobody, scare you guys. Nobody took that seriously. We had a couple of blokes in our platoon at Pakapanyo. One bloke had applied for the regular army three times and got knocked back, but he got called up for national service. And another bloke had a club foot, so they had to have special boots made for him. But we were the cream of Australia's youth. <laughs> Bullshit. So you chose to specialise in engineering. Why was that? I don't know. Being the first call-up, we pretty much had our choice of of what we could do. Our platoon sergeant at Pakapanyal was an engineer and they were based in Sydney. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. And where were you deployed to in Vietnam and when did you arrive there? Well, we arrived in May 66 to Nui Dat. Can you tell me about the first operation you undertook? Yes, it was called uh, Operation Hobart. The, there was some of the, well, the guys from 3 Troop who'd been stationed at, uh, with the Americans at an airbase called Benoit moved over with us to Nui Dat and um, we were paired, we were, we, were, we were each paired with one of their blokes uh, for Operation Hobart. Uh, we found a few tunnels and blew a few up. All fun and games. Let's talk about that Operation Hobart, blowing up tunnels. What was your first exposure to a tunnel, do you recall? The infantry kept on finding the things, and we kept on going down them. We didn't find anything down any of them. Uh, They were fairly shallow, and we had to 
slither along on our stomachs to, to get through them. But no, we blew them up. We used TNT, which was fairly safe. We had TNT or um, plastic, which is plastic explosive. We didn't really use that to blow anything up, but it was good for boiling your billy. Burnt very hot, and you could boil a billy of water for, for a cup of tea in a few seconds. The infantry weren't too impressed with it. They used to run for miles when we, we lit up those things. <laughs> the engineers are having supper quick. Everyone get out. That's right. <laughs> so was it claustrophobic going through there? or I suppose it must have been. I, I, don't, I have no recollection of it bothering me, but it must have been, obviously, yeah. And I imagine there was a variety of lengths, shapes, sizes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, most of them were fairly small. I, You read about, well, those, the tunnels at Coochie that are now a big tourist attraction, you could apparently stand up in them and they had rooms and hospitals and dormitories and all sorts of things in them, but I never saw any like that. Ours were all pretty small. I'm sure those were the other more tourist-friendly versions than what you were to deal with. So you didn't come across any enemy down there, thankfully. But did you find any caches or intelligence or gear? Yeah, yeah, we found uh, weapons sometimes and uh, uh, food caches, documents, stuff like that. And you'd just pass up chain of command and see what it led to? Yep. Did you come across any wild animals in the tunnels? Uh, a rooster I came across, yeah. Very angry rooster. He'd fallen into the tunnel and because the tunnel went down at an angle of about 75 degrees and then flattened out it wasn't wide enough for him to spread his wings and fly out so he kept on trying to to get out of this tunnel and couldn't and uh, yeah he was he was very angry i had to blow the tunnel with the chook inside it with a rooster inside it <laughs> yeah i couldn't get near him we received no training at all in tunnels we just had to pick it up as we went so you just crawl down in there with a lamp on your head, pistol and bayonet in your Oh, hands. no, no lamps. No, no lamps. Had a, had a handheld torch and a pistol, yeah. So you've just been a juggler the whole time. If you were feeling for booby traps, you couldn't you couldn't carry both, so you probably had to put your pistol away and use one hand for your torch and the other to feel your way. But we were the first ones, don't forget. Was that ever intimidating? No. I was there to do a job and uh, I did it. I, I had no particular feelings for or against the war it was just it was a job just my job yeah did you ever come under fire out on patrol yeah first operation we were on we uh, bloke got uh, badly wounded one of the infantry blokes got badly wounded by a sniper this bloke apparently just popped up out of a tunnel and shot him and then popped back in and nobody even knew where the guy was or where he'd come from or anything so nobody saw him i certainly didn't our engineer's job in a firefighters to hit the deck keep your head down because the infantry have their their set uh, moves for dealing with ambushes and what have you so in a situation like that you hit the deck and stay prone and keep yourself secure it's a smart move but was there ever a situation you say have to do a hasty retreat or whatnot i mean i imagine you guys could stumble into booby traps or well that's what we were there for basically but no no that never happened to, not to me anyway when you're not on patrol, what were some of your day-to-day -day duties at Nui Dad? Oh, well, I was a truck driver. Being the first task force, we, we had to build the task force area, basically. So we made roads and dug ditches and all sorts of stuff like that. Built an airfield. Basically, engineers do everything that nobody else wants to do. So, you know. You're the guys that get the stuff done so everyone else can do their own I thing. I suppose so, yeah. What was the atmosphere at Nui Dad like? Oh, it's quite good. Did you ever feel in danger at the camp or pretty safe? Not until till the night we got mortared. Just before um, uh, Long Tan, uh, we were mortared. Uh, but luckily, we were uh, most of the task force was in a rubber plantation and uh, the mortars exploded high up in the rubber trees. We got a few blokes wounded. Our uh, troop commander got, his, got a leg blown off. Uh, a few other blokes got wounded, but no one was killed, thank God. Do you remember your reaction or emotional response at the time that happened? A little bit perturbed, I suppose. We all had pits near our tents that we could get into, but the first thing the next morning I, I extended my pit and put a put a steel roof over the top. <laughs> I didn't want to get caught out in the area. I remember thinking there was one, there was a couple of mortars came through just over to my right, and what I thought was... Right into the to the pit of the of the bloke's 
next to me, but luckily they too exploded in the in the rubber trees and no one was hurt. Where were you during long term? <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, it was it was D Company Six Ra that was involved in uh, in long term. I was I was out with A Company at the time. Uh, Weren't A Company sent to reinforce D Company at one stage? Yeah, yeah. But I was driving with truck somewhere in the task force, and an officer came up and said, "We need you for a couple of hours to take some blokes, some infantry blokes out." So they piled into the back of my truck, and I took them to where they wanted to go. But then we were told we were supposed to stay there. So we had we had no food or or, or uh, ammunition or sleeping bags or any of them things. So. Were you at Nui Dat for the whole tour? Hmm. I was. Did you have any experience with minefields? No. Um, luckily, the whole idea of the minefield only came to fruition towards the end of my tour, and uh, I got out just before the guys started laying the mines. Touch wood, I. If I had been there another couple of weeks, I probably would have been involved in laying them, but I wasn't and I didn't, and uh, thank goodness for that. We lost a lot of guys in that minefield. What about Agent Orange? Were you aware of being exposed? Uh, no, not at the time. I remember doing patrols through areas that had been hit by it. It was just like all the, everything was dead, you know. There was trees. And, and I remember myself spraying something along the... Uh, boundary of, of the squadron to, to keep the keep the undergrowth down off the barbed wire, but uh, what it was, I don't know. That's unbelievable that you were just told to spray this stuff without knowing what it was. Well, Agent Orange is a generic name for There was an orange band painted around the, the drums that the stuff came in. It wasn't orange coloured, but there was Agent Purple and Agent Green and Agent White, and they were all defoliants of, of one. The common denominator was... Uh, a chemical called dioxin, which is uh, about as poisonous as you can get. Uh, it's been banned in a lot of 245T and 24D that farmers used to use on their crops. Had dioxin in it, but uh, I think it's been banned now. I understand there was a brigadier who wanted a particular machine, courtesy of the engineers. Oh, no, he wanted a nice-making machine, yeah, for his scotch. But we had a, um, a stores troop attached to our squadron and we handled the stores for the uh, for the task force. And this ice-making machine turned up one day, so we, we grabbed it and concreted it into the floor of the OR's mess. And there it stayed. We were the only mess in the task force with an ice-making machine. Don't know what the brigadier did. <laughs> Didn't get his ice-making machine, though. Had to have his scotch neat. Looking back as you get towards the end of your tour, can you possibly guess how many ops and patrols you went out on or was it just constant no it wasn't constant in fact they used us up a bit towards the end of our tour or me anyway it never was constant for the guys that came after us they were out on patrol a lot more than we were because quite often with us because we had so much work to do it inside the task force if the infantry came across tunnels they'd uh, they'd stop and then they'd fly us out and chop us to to go through them Infantry wouldn't go near them, poor buggers. I don't blame them either. But so yeah, quite often we'd get picked up by armoured um, personnel carriers or helicopters and take it out to to where the tunnels were. Are there any other moments that stand out from your time in Vietnam? As I mentioned before, I've buried it for fifty years, and it's a bit hard to dig it up again. I suppose I I learned to respect the Vietnamese people a great deal. They'd been involved in wars for God knows how long, but they had before us was the French and the Chinese. Everybody wanted a piece of them. But they'd, uh, they'd stood up to it extremely well. Whether a European country could do that, I don't know. But I did have a great respect for them. Did you have much time interacting with the locals in their villages? Yeah. What were they like? Pretty much uh, kept away from us. <laughs> we were the enemy to most of them. I mean, most of them had no choice as to who they supported. If the Viet Cong were, uh, were in their village, then they had to support them or they'd, the Viet Cong would kill them, simple as that. You know. uh, if the government was there, the same thing applied. Most of them just wanted, most of them were farmers and most of them just wanted to get on with their lives. But the politics, of course, screwed everything up for them. And what was your return home like? <laughs> well, it was just a blind relief, I suppose. I, I'd got out of the place alive. We, I got on a truck to Vang Tao, which is where the logistics support group was, and got on a got a plane from Vang Tao to Tonsonut, 
in Saigon. I can't remember what sort of plane it was. And then got a Hercules from Saigon to the Darwin and uh, got on a Qantas flight from Darwin to Sydney. Uh, they kept us, well, they snuck us in the back door at Sydney Airport, you know, to keep us away from what I assume was demonstrators at the front. I don't know. You said you'd buried your time in Vietnam for 50 years. Why was that? It's very difficult to talk about it to anyone other than somebody who's been through it themselves. If you try and talk to it, talk about it to somebody who hasn't been through it, they tend to start shuffling their feet and wishing they were somewhere else, you know, because they don't understand it and I don't blame them for that. It's, it's completely foreign to most people's uh, lifestyle. Uh, even with people I served with, we don't really discuss it much. Uh, why did I bury it? I don't know. It just seemed the easiest way to do it. So you come back to a very unceremonious reception, both from the government and from the public. What did you go on to do in life after the military? The repatriation department put me through a course in computer programming. So I did that for the next 20 odd years. Uh, I spent three years in Europe during that time, bumming around, hitchhiking. Sounds perfect. And then you uh, ran a limousine business. Uh, Yes, I was a part owner of it, yeah. Since the Welcome Home March, have you ever, did you participate in that march? And have you ever marched on an Anzac Day after that? I have a couple of times, yeah. Getting a bit of an effort these days, though. Have you experienced any flashbacks or PTSD? Yeah. What are the flashbacks to? Oh, let's talk about something else, eh? Fair enough. How do you look back on your time in Vietnam today? Funnily enough, it's been a tremendous advantage to me because I'm, I'm on a TPI from the Veterans Affairs Department, which means I get all my, my medical bills, all my hospital bills, dentist, eye specialist, ears, everything, even vaguely medical, I get paid for. I bought a, a new car a couple of months ago, and I don't pay GST on that. So I get 10% off. A, there are some car. perks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's in the end, it's, it's turned out to be advantageous, but didn't seem so at the time, did they? I've uh, spoken before on this podcast with David Buckwalter. I understand he's a school friend of yours. Mm. Do you two ever talk about it much? No, not much. David, well, he probably told you he was involved in an incident in the minefield. and Yeah, he shared that story. Well, uh, he's shared it with me on more than one occasion. Um, it's, yeah, well, anyway, yeah. So I've talked to David about his experiences, not about mine, no. I think the Afghan blokes are being treated just as badly as we were. There isn't the mass demonstrations that there was against us, but I don't think anybody's looking after them any better than we were. It's odd that the public sentiment has improved over Vietnam in regards to the troops, but you're right, there's a almost a repeat of history going on before us. I think so. Well, Ross, I feel any mistreatment towards you or and the fact that you felt you've not been able to share your story for all this time or not felt comfortable doing so upsets me. And I'm very grateful that you shared it with me today. And I think you've done a wonderful service to our country because you played your part in what was seen as necessary at the time. Whether we look back and agree with the actions or the policies of the government or not, the soldiers were on the ground doing their best. And Ask, ask me if I would have done it if I hadn't been called up. Would you have done it? If... No, not a million years. <laughs> but you did it. Yes, I did it. David Buckwalter, uh, he said something to me once that's um, always stuck with me, that I I asked if he served willingly or was conscripted before um, over the phone before we chatted properly on the podcast. And he said, I was conscripted, but I served willingly. Not everyone joined up, but everyone served, whether they were called up. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Whether that was true later on, I don't know, but in the early days it was certainly true, yeah. Or else, thank you for coming in and sharing your story with me today. No problem. That was my conversation with Ross Tullow. On another occasion, I spoke with Ian Willoughby, a Vietnam veteran and career army man. Welcome to Life on the Line. I'm Alex Lloyd, and I'm joined today by Ian Willoughby. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Ian. Thank you. Ian, you were born in 1940. How did the country's recent memory of World War II affect your childhood growing up? 
I don't remember a lot about the war as such, uh, other than I can remember sailors, uh, vi- visiting sailors being coming home for to have meals with us, and I can remember visiting warships in the uh, harbour. I can certainly remember the 15th of August when we were given half a day off school and uh, to celebrate, um, but it, it didn't mean a lot to us at, as a five-year-old. Sort of thing. Did you have any family fight in the war? My father was away, uh, but not overseas. He was of a, a, a more of an age that they decided to keep him back as an instructor in Australia. But he was away for the most of the period of the war. And did anyone further up your tree had served in the Great War? I had a uh, um, uncle that served in the Light Horse in the First World War. Besides your family history, what was your first exposure to military life? Basically, uh, from the time at Knox where we had the school cadets, I suppose, uh, fully involved for the four years I was at Knox uh, in the school cadets, uh, going through um, various stages right up to being a a cadet under officer in the final year. Did you pursue any particular specialities within the cadets? I did have some uh, time in the second last year in the uh, anti-tank gun uh, time, which gave us a bit of fun uh, playing around with a a six... uh, what was it, a six-inch gun? Pounder gun, that was, six-pounder. You also did bushwalking, I believe. Yeah, I joined bushwalking uh, group at Knox and uh, was involved quite heavily with them, uh, doing a number of walks around New South Wales. And in uh, 56, I, uh, with a group, we did a trip down to Tasmania to try and do the overland walk uh, in 1956. Unfortunately, one of our teachers got sick and we had to turn back without doing the whole trip through the the lake from Lake Sinclair through to Cradle Mountain. So you had all that military training, as it were, through the cadet days and all the bushwalking experience. You're, are you intentionally setting yourself up for a military career? or Not really. I, I, I really wanted to become a geologist. Uh, I was good at um, map reading or, or using maps, and uh, in doing the, ge- the mapping side of geology, I was very good at that. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a good enough mark to get a scholarship. And the military came along and offered me a a career at Dundrone. So that was what started it for you? Yes. So was it out of convenience or the opportunity that you chose to take it up or were you quite taken with the idea anyway of joining the army? I think I just went along with what what actually happened. They sent me the tickets and the list of equipment to bring and it was all fait accompli when I didn't have to make a decision. And you went along with it for 24 years. (laughs) That's correct. And it was a good career. And you eventually found yourself in the Royal Australian Signals Corps. Yeah. After the four years at Duntroon, you have to actually select a corps. At the time, I was doing radio engineering at Duntroon, and um, I went on after Duntroon to do two years full-time as a communication engineer at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT. And so that basically put me straight into the Signal Corps. So you spend six years training for this. It's not like you just do a boot camp and they give you a rifle. It's really intense specialist work. We had to do the basic work right from the start, of course, and we did it all the basic work that uh, any infantry officer did, but we actually had to do the more advanced engineering side of it as well. After you completed RMIT, where were you first posted? After RMIT, I was posted initially to Sydney, uh, but then attached back to Canberra to run a signal troop that ran all the communications for the uh, army headquarters in Canberra. And then you were a captain shortly after that? Uh, Promoted to captain and uh, put into the instructors for the new National Service Officer Training School at Skyville near Windsor, uh, where they took a selected National Servicemen who had volunteered to do advanced training. And in six months, we actually trained them up to be lieutenants, second lieutenants uh, in the army. And I uh, was in charge of map reading uh, at the training there, but I only lasted there for six months. I was put into our School of Signals training our own signal soldiers on the use of uh, equipment. We had bought a lot of American radio relay and communications equipment, which I had been using extensively with the Americans. So I was right in a good position to be put in charge of training our own soldiers with that. So I spent nine months, uh, no, exactly longer than that, it was, it was 18 months in, in um, Melbourne in our School of Signals at Balcom, uh, setting that up before I was then allocated to a unit uh, ready to go to Vietnam. I went to Vietnam in uh, February 68. Uh, 
So you would have arrived there just after the Tet Offensive? Two weeks after. How did you feel escaping that? Standing up against a wall and not, not making yourself... <laughs> It was, it was a situation that you, when you arrived, you really didn't know what you were up against. But after a couple of weeks, you sort of learned to relax and live with it, and, and except for the last two weeks before you're coming home, I suppose. What was the atmosphere like in that initial period on base then, besides your own sort of back-against-the-wall tension? It was at the stage where, in fact, we arrived uh, on the aircraft, we unloaded, we were sent into the Free World building um, to meet the units and uh, that and then we were about to go be allocated to our quarters in Saigon when they said there's a raid coming in, there was uh, rockets coming in, and I finished up for the first two nights sleeping in a weapon pit in the, uh, the outside the building. Welcome to Vietnam. Welcome to Vietnam. It, it was a really wake-up call or something, and it wasn't after that that I actually got to find uh, the quarters that we were allocated to. What was your initial role in Saigon? I was sent up there as the 2IC second in command of the uh, signal squadron that provided communications between all the rearward of the task force base at Nui Dat, uh, back to logistic base at Vung Tau, to the headquarters up at Saigon, and from there back to Australia. And we, we provided all that communications. And as to IC, I was really responsible for administration and you know backing up the OC in the work he was running the squadron. So you would have participated in the second phase of the Tet Offensive in May? Yes. Um, in fact, I, I was uh, in the, the quarters overnight when, in fact, we heard that the uh, second Tet Offensive had actually come in and uh, that the VC and Arvind had actually uh, attacked around where our transmitter space was, just outside the Tonsonut base in Saigon. And um, we had a, a section of about six of our members there and a group of infantry who used to come up and help to guard that uh, transmitter base uh, that were out there by themselves under the command of a sergeant. So that was the, the situation we were faced with first thing in the morning. Can you talk me through the rest of that day from your point of view? Well, you know, the, the OC spoke to me and said that he wants to see if I can get out to the actual base to take over and find out what the situation was. And uh, my f first action was to actually uh, talk to an American helicopter pilot on the helicopter pad in the Free World building, at the back of the Free World building, and see if he could uh, run me out. He, he was quite happy to actually take me out there. We flew out over the base and we were circling over the top of the area. And you've got to understand that we have actually have a large antenna, um, a couple of hundred yards long and 100 yards wide uh, in, in a uh, diamond shape or two antennas uh, nested together. And from the air, I couldn't see the wires, so how could I tell the pilot where the wires were and how he could put, actually put me down there? And while we were circling around trying to work out what to do, he asked was me, where's the ground fire? Because uh, he said there was bullets coming up past us. So at that point, I suggested we, we go back to the Free World building, which we did. Uh, back there, I uh, organised a group of soldiers uh, with a Land Rovers, or two Land Rovers, and uh, we then drove out there fully armed uh, to try and get into the place, which we managed to do, and take over the base. But the base was effectively surrounded at the time. We did see signs of enemy action, dead uh, enemy on the side of the road, and the uh, uh, Vietnamese army f uh, units in the area w were fighting around the outside of our uh, compound area at that stage. How heavy was the fire as you were driving um, in? Uh, it was only intermittent during that, that period, but uh, when you arrive there, you don't know. But, you know, we went to ground. There was a bus parked across the entrance to the compound, so we actually had to go to ground until somebody came out and moved the bus so we could get in there. Uh, which we did, and we uh, sorted out the situation, worked out uh, what defences we had. We had American soldiers from uh, adjacent bases, post office and, and ambulance bases, who had actually come into our area because we were much more secure than their area and uh, had sort of taken up residence in our bunkers and wouldn't, wouldn't leave. So we had a, quite a problem in trying to sort it all out, but... We, we managed to get it all right for a while. It was a pretty gutsy move over there as well. You're trying to fly in there in the first place in a hot LZ. I don't think I realised just how dangerous it was, by the way. Did things calm down in the short term after that for you? Oh, it, it sort of went um, with various actions going on in the 
uh, the area around uh, the compound had a, a large high wire fence uh, which had been built by the Americans and uh, outside that was a huge refugee village in which there were a lot of refugees uh, living in, in. They used to do... Uh, you could see that they had machines in there doing sewing and, and various work that they used to do. And there was obviously action going on in there. And there was uh, action between the uh, Arvin Vietnamese forces and uh, other... I mean, you'd see them firing away. And, and we sort of fairly kept uh, ourselves fairly low and, and didn't want to actually interfere with it to any great extent um, until at one stage the sort of the... There was some rock, uh, some bullets came into our area, and, and we returned fire to, to where that came from. For one of our machine gunners did. Then a, a, there was a, a rocket that came and, and hit our uh, toilet block, shall we say, <laughs> and uh, put a big hole through the side of the toilet block. Fortunately, there was nobody in the toilet block at the time. When you're walking around day to day, are you also equipped with a rifle, or are you fully kitted up with a radio and you just have a pistol, or what's your no. gear like? As an officer, I didn't actually carry a radio. I had soldiers so to do. Carry it for yeah. you. But um, I did. Uh, uh, as a normal thing, I was only armed with a, a nine millimeter pistol. But for the uh, the work going out there, I armed myself with a a, a full rifle because, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a pistol I could probably throw it as accurately as I could fire it, and uh, I, I was a good shot with with a rifle. And it's going to do a lot more good than a nine mil. <laughs> It'll stop somebody. Put it away. In that first phase, what were your day-to-day duties like and how did that change over time? To make sure they were fed and, and uh, that we had set the place up properly, defended all around, that we, we had, had, had a good control over it and that people got their normal rest when they needed to and things like that. That was the main thing. I, I just took over that command and reported back to uh, the, the headquarters back in the free, what was the free world building in Saigon. And your role eventually changed to quartermaster? Well, that was well after that. That was after what what actually occurred during the the, the offensive is that a fire started in the refugee village, and that resulted in uh, burning down the antennas uh, that were had the rear guy wires going back into the refugee village and dropping the, those uh, antennas, and that was our rear link back to Australia, and uh, we had to try and rectify that as best we could and. I had some soldiers that went out and repaired the, the antenna the best they could so we could actually get communications back. What we decided uh, after that and uh, with the problems associated with the way the squadron was running was that we had millions of dollars worth of very high technical equipment and the way the squadron was organised, it only had uh, staff sergeants in charge of uh, that quartermaster staff sergeant who weren't really very technical and didn't necessarily know what all this equipment was. So they, they could sign invoices and, and fill out forms and things like that. So it was decided that I should take over until we could get a, a, a normally trained quartermaster up there as an officer or quartermaster. And so uh, I was put into that role for the second six months that I was there. But during that time we relocated the headquarters, the Wung Tau, and the transmitting uh, facilities from Futo base uh, outside the Tontanut base into the Nui Dat area, and that uh, went ahead. And then after my time, that was relocated back to Wung Tau as well because they didn't want the transmitter sitting up there in the middle of the Nui Dat base with big antennas sitting up 100 feet in the air with lights on the top of them. Please shoot at me. Yeah. Let's backtrack a bit and talk about Coral and Balmoral. I really can't comment on on those other than they occurred just after that second Tet when the Australian forces were uh, deployed north of Saigon uh, into an area which actually turned out to be right on the... uh, almost on top of the headquarters of the main Vietnamese force and uh, there are many other people more than me that can deploy on that. I, I saw people that had had to uh, try and get communications in there. I, I know that we lost uh, so many people, including communications people that uh, were working there at the uh, the fire support base. We as a, a, a unit actually provided communications rearward of that fire support base back into our normal communications. 
Did you ever feel safe in Saigon? Could you ever relax? You learnt to relax uh, because you didn't have any choice, but you you had to stay aware and you didn't put yourself in danger that uh, was obvious. So you wouldn't go and walk around a market or anything like this. Downtown Saigon during the day was okay as long as you were there in groups and we we did visit that and we, we used to use the American bars there. But uh, at night time we were normally locked up in the, the bachelor officer quarters and the soldiers were locked up in their uh, quarters as well. And uh, you know, that caused some problems because the soldiers were walking around with armed weapons and quite often very drunk and it was a very dangerous situation. How did Vung Tao compare to Saigon? Oh, that's a picnic. Oh, not quite. It, it, Saigon Bay, uh, sorry, the Vung Tao base uh, was on the sand hills behind the beach uh, at the back of the, the, uh, the, the township of Vung Tao, which is a port. And that whole area was uh, surrounded by barbed wire and uh, we had all the uh, headquarters there. We had the various messes and uh, the, uh, they actually had a... a uh, recreational area there for the soldiers on R&R coming down from Nui Dat. And uh, they, they had a swimming pool and diving boards and carnivals and they had various beaches along the beach where they could surf. And, in fact, uh, we, as a, a signal corps, actually had a f- speedboat sent up to us uh, by the welfare people in Australia. And that during that time there I was responsible for the maintenance and looking after and allocation of uh, that speedboat, uh, usage of that speedboat. It's a very important responsibility. Oh, yeah, yes, especially as we were uh, water skiing in the choppy beach water and uh, the aluminium used to break down, but we'd, we'd always take it down to the American Marine Base and they would solder it up for us again and weld it, weld it up for us again. And in fact, at one stage we blew up the motor and they just gave us a new motor. So it's, it's very good to be friendly with the Americans during there. Does that all count as PT or...? No, well, it, it, it's recreation. It's it's relaxing, and for the chaps that were on on duty, and really during the time or well, the time in Saigon, we uh, were there for the uh, the first four months with no time off at all. And there was no such thing as a sort of weekend or anything. You you were working every day, and uh, you worked the full daylight time, and you went and locked up yourself up at night. And many other soldiers based in Vietnam, Vung Tau would be their prime destination for RNC leave, and you're already there. So yeah, that's right. Dream scenario. Can you tell me more about the responsibilities of your role as quartermaster by the time you were in Vung Tau and the scale of it all, so the dollar value and the amount of equipment you're looking after? You would understand that we actually had vehicles sent up there which were fully kitted out with major electronic equipment for repairing of communications equipment. And what uh, they had done was that they actually had stripped these vehicles out of their all their equipment and put it into into buildings that had been built there. So th- these vehicles w- were what they call a complete equipment schedule, and nobody had actually bothered to, to keep a track of what had been taken out of it, where it was, and in fact most of it had been returned to stores when it didn't stop working and uh, had, they had written it off as not important because it was it was a CS account, a complete equipment schedule, and this was wartime type accounting, which unfortunately the same plane that I flew up there, they sent two auditors up to try and uh, get control over the actual Q accounting within Saigon. So that was the sort of the problem uh, that occurred. Did you have much interaction with the local population? Yes, it's, uh, we, we actually had a local population who used to work with us as cleaners and, and help out in the base. Most of them had to be able to be cleared. I remember the first day, first couple of days I was in Saigon, I actually had to go and get a haircut and I went down to the uh, American PX and there was a Vietnamese barber. Um, and he was cutting my hair and using cutthroat razor to then uh, trim me at the at the same time. I felt a little bit un- unsecure about it, but uh, you learnt that there was a lot of Vietnamese who were very friendly with us and, and very happy. The locals were, you know, in a lot of ways, quite delightful people. Was there much talk amongst you guys or awareness at the time of the impact the war was having on the local population? You had to be aware that uh, the, the impact it had simply f- from uh, the destruction that was being done when the VEC came in or something during the Tet Offensive to see the destruction 
when we first arrived and and we're driving around Saigon, there was square miles of areas which were just totally flattened. American helicopters had, had come in and where the VC had been attacking through this area, and they just flattened the area. And of course, that's have a devastating effect on all local people as well. So it it was one of those things. But most of them were happy to help us. In fact, they would tell us if they they thought we were in danger. And, It was quite interesting. So when did your deployment in Vietnam finally end? The end of January in 69. How did it feel to finally leave Vietnam knowing you were done there? We cheered as we took off and we cheered as we landed. A non-stop flight from Saigon straight to Sydney. The plane was totally overloaded and I don't know how that thing actually took off, but once it took off it was going to get there. You were a career army man, and when your deployment to Vietnam ended, you wanted to keep going with the army. Where were you posted next? I was posted uh, initially what I thought to a signals unit in uh, Ingleburn in Sydney, but when I arrived there, they said, oh, no, you're actually taking over a squadron uh, from here and moving it to Townsville. So I was actually put in charge of a signal squadron, task force signal squadron, relocated that to Townsville, uh, where the new task force base was being uh, set up in the new base in Townsville, Laverick Barracks, and initially 30-odd men, no equipment. So for three months you have to sort of do PT and paint stones and classes and keep the soldiers busy. But it wasn't a lot of soldiers. Eventually the unit built up to over 100, and um, these days it's one of the most active uh, units in the Australian Army in Townsville. I imagine the simplicity of that posting after Vietnam was quite therapeutic. It was good in, in, in that I actually had a clean slate to get a unit going from scratch with new equipment. I wasn't taking over anybody else's problems. Can you talk me through some of your highlights from your career for the next few years? After the time in Townsville, I was posted back into Material Branch buying equipment and looking after various equipments for the communications around Australia. Spent a couple of years there and then I was posted to do a course over in the UK with the UK Military University at Shrivenham near Swindon in the UK. And that's a one-year graduate diploma type course on uh, procurement of all military type hardware. A very interesting course. So I did that and I went there with my family for a year. I came back from that and and worked for three years in the procurement side of uh, the Army and Defence Department. And uh, after that, I was actually sent back to the UK for another three years project management of of major UK procurement of uh, tactical digital radio systems for the British Army on the Rhine. That was working in, in London for that period. So that was very interesting. And what rank were you by this point? I was Lieutenant Colonel at, at the end of that uh, stage. And where'd you go after London? Came back to Canberra and they put me back into the same old job and so I decided that I uh, was going to resign from the Army as I was being held in a, a technical job rather than being put into a command-type position. So you retired from the Army in June 1982 at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 24 years with the Army. Mm. That's quite a career. What did you move on to do after that? Because I'm sure you weren't done. I got a job as communications officer for the State Government Computing Centre in uh, Brisbane. But after about four months there, I was actually uh, headhunted to go back into the involvement with military communications on a major project for the command and control of the Australian Field Force using automated computing systems. And that was a four-year posting as a civilian contractor working in the inaugural army base and uh, visiting and uh, looking at the how computers could assist the command and control in the army. So that was a fascinating period. And uh, after the four years there, I uh, got a position on it with the civilian computer systems house in Brisbane. And I involved, was involved where I was in project management, quality, quality assurance, and uh, eventually administration of the uh, the company, working uh, right through till '98, when uh, I was retrenched when the company was bought out by an American company. And Ian, how do you look back on your time with the military today? 
you had a great career. You don't know what you would have happened if different things happened, but you've got to go with what you served, what, what happens. And I was quite happy to sort of go with that. I like to command people, but the, the, the command I used was more of a management style than necessarily uh, uh, using military law to, to do the things. I liked to bring people out and get their ideas on how to, how to run a unit or how they thought things could be done better, and I played that game pretty well, I thought. It's quite a career. Thank you for speaking with me, Ian. I hope you enjoyed today's conversations with Ross and Ian. If you liked the episode, please go to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review in the podcast section. It makes a big difference in helping other people discover the show. You can contact us by emailing podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Also visit our website, www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com, where you'll also find our social media details. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>